Hi, I'm Tim Tyler and this is a review of this book, Darwin's Cathedral, Evolution, Religion and the Nature of Society by David Sloan Wilson. This is a relatively early book by a scientist looking at religion. Religion is a messy subject which only a few scientists have attempted to deal with. Wilson's thesis is that religion is functional and that its associated benefits accrue to groups of humans. He compares religious communities to beehives on the grounds that their members cooperate with each other almost as much as members of a beehive do. What are we to make of David's thesis? Bees in hives cooperate because they are extremely close relatives since they are all daughters of the same queen. However, most humans in religious communities are not anywhere near as closely related, so in terms of DNA genes, the relationship between religious communities and beehives is pretty far-fetched. However, religious communities also share their memes, and a reasonable fraction of their memes is shared between community members. In particular, the memes associated with their religion are often present in the form of near-identical copies in different members of the same religious community. Cultural relatedness does not necessarily lead towards cooperation between the hosts involved, but it can do so. Much depends on the nature of the memes in question and the strength of the host's memetic immune system. Memes don't have a free ride in manipulating the behaviour of their host since they must compete with the other memes in the host and the host's own DNA genes. However, with large co-adapted meme complexes, many memes can gang up together in an attempt to influence their host by force of numbers. And that's exactly what religious memes do. They evidently do have considerable success in influencing their host's behaviour. So, a comparison with bees may have something to it though mimetic relatedness between humans from the same religious group is probably not as high as genetic relatedness between bees within hives. Another of the ideas that David advocates is that religion is functional, by which he seems to mean adaptive to humans or groups of humans. He contrasts this position with religion as a byproduct hypothesis. Economic theories involving religion as a form of transaction with alleged supernatural agents and the idea of religion as selfish means. I think most consider religion to be frequently adaptive to its hosts. Religious people typically have more kids than secularists, often quite a lot more. One of the insights into the subject from cultural evolution is that when talking about the adaptive function of some aspect of religion, the DNA genes of the hosts are not the only possible beneficiary. Religious traditions may be treated as cultural symbionts which have adaptations that benefit themselves. Wilson acknowledges the possible viability of such hypotheses, but categorises them in such a way that they compete with his own adaptive explanation. He categorises adaptive theories of religion into those that invoke benefits to individuals, those that invoke benefits to groups, and those that treat religion as a cultural parasite that often evolves at the expense of individuals and groups. However, real religions vary considerably in the extent to which the interests of their means is aligned with the interests of the DNA genes of their hosts. Those religions which are transmitted primarily vertically down the generations can be expected to have evolved to have interests aligned with those of their hosts. Cultural and organic evolution pulling in the same direction explains the cases where religious groups typically have many children. By contrast, evangelical religions depend less on vertical transmission with respect to their hosts and spread virally even between unrelated hosts. Such religions can be expected to be less in tune with the interest of their host's DNA genes and more inclined towards redirecting host reproductive resources into mean propagation via evangelism, and they'll tend to be nastier religions. David correctly identifies kin selection at work, although he classifies it as group selection. Since group selection and kin selection are now widely thought to be equivalent, this is a valid perspective. However, he doesn't really identify it as a cultural phenomenon. Indeed, he seems to identify cultural evolution with the idea of demonic memes that act as parasites on humans and then largely ignores it. Instead, he proposes that human groups act as the beneficiaries of selection on religions. This seems like a muddled way of looking at the situation to me. Instead, the human genes are weakly kin-selected and the religious memes are strongly kin-selected and the genes and the memes co-evolve in a symbiosis. The interests of the memes and the genes are somewhat aligned, largely due to the component of vertical transmission of religious beliefs down the generations. I felt that David's treatment of the topic muddled together cultural and organic evolution. It is possible to ask whether religion is adaptive without distinguishing between cultural and organic evolution. I compare this approach to asking whether smallpox is adaptive. Through much of human history, smallpox helped groups of humans 
with smallpox to obliterate other groups of humans that lacked it. Evidently, smallpox is an adaptive trait at the group level. While partially accurate, this analysis is unorthodox and misses out much of interest about the relationship between the smallpox virus and its human hosts. David's explanation of religion is like this. He just says it's adaptive at the group level, without teasing apart the relationship between the cultural and organic components of the system involved. David does display some understanding of cultural evolution in the book. He invokes Calvin and Plotkin's idea of Darwin machines, uses it to explain how the brain evolves in a Darwinian fashion, and then goes on to explain that human culture evolves. The section near the start of the book about cultural evolution is quite reasonable as far as it goes. Mimetics isn't the only rival theory that I felt David treated unsympathetically. He also contrasts his approach with the idea of religion as a byproduct. While functional explanations and byproduct exp explanations can be seen as being opposed, it's pretty evident that the various byproduct theories of religion have a considerable amount going for them. The hyperactive agent detection device idea is correct, for example. Byproduct hypotheses explain quite a few aspects of religion. Also, some of the traits which religion is thought to be a byproduct of are themselves adaptive traits, so byproduct hardly means the same as non adaptive. I think that we should accept many of the byproduct hypotheses concerning religion without necessarily granting them everything. It would be nice to have a scientific understanding of religion, not least so that we can build new and better religions that draw from the best parts of their historical practices while missing out their toxic elements. However, to do that we need to understand which bits of religion are desirable and which are not. Some things are obvious. Yoga and meditation are good, while hellfire and the oppression of women are not. However, with other practices things are not always so clear. Just saying that religions are adaptive doesn't really help to identify which are the useful religious practices. At the end of the book, David explains that a grant from the Templeton Foundation helped to finance the book. The Templeton Foundation is famous for paying scientists to say nice things about religion. I expect that this funding source will turn off some readers. Studying religion seems like a dirty job for a scientist, but somebody has to do it. David Sloan Wilson seems to be okay with the topic. However, back in 2002, he seemed to be rather hampered by his preference for explanations based on group selection and his reluctance to conceptually separate out cultural and organic evolution. Also, alas, this book isn't terribly readable. I found the long section analysing Calvinism in the middle to be especially tedious. I recommend that those interested in David's work should read Evolution for Everyone first. Enjoy.